Don't let anyone know you're here. In this video, I'll share with you my endoscopic posterior cervical foraminotomy secrets. Get ready to learn the technical nuances and accelerate beyond endoscopy 101. And while you're here, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe for more spine-related content. Indications for endoscopic posterior cervical foraminotomy are really identical to any technique of posterior foraminotomy. Um, it's ideally people with monoradiculopathy unilateral, where you can, in a very targeted way, identify where the problem is coming from and with laser-like precision address that. And most patients have a monoradiculopathy. It's less common for patients to simultaneously develop a problem else, like multiple other places. So this has become, you know, the primary way that I treat cervical radiculopathy. The benefits of the endoscope are not just a smaller incision, um, but really what happens under the skin, which is obviously this is kind of the running theme. You know, you're not disrupting the soft tissues. So patients bounce back amazingly quickly. You can do this as an outpatient. But there's some other really nice benefits as well. So the endoscopic fluid helps tamponade that venous plexus that runs around the nerve in the foramen, which can be really annoying to deal with if you're doing this any other way. And so bleeding becomes much, much less of an issue, and your visualization is really phenomenal. Additionally, because of the angled um, orientation of the endoscopic scope, you can look around corners. And so you can see back toward yourself. And there's a very nice study that I referenced here where they actually took patients who had a foraminotomy used, using a, a variety of different types of techniques and compared them. And what they found is that with the uniportal endoscopy, um, the surgeons were able to create a s sufficient foraminal opening while preserving more of the facet joint. And the reason for that is the endoscope is so small and narrow that you can drop your hand toward midline and undercut the foramen uh, and really expand that space with less of a concern for creating instability, et cetera. And then as a result of, you know, the smaller surgical footprint, clearly the um, post-operative outcomes are, are very good. The patients bounce back really nicely uh, with shorter length of stay and post-op neck pain. These are some of my statistics that we published. Um, you know, my length of stay is just over two hours. Patients go home afterwards. Um, arm pain, neck pain, NDI all improved substantially in sustained manner. So let's go through a case together, and I'll talk you through the way that I do this on a step-by-step -step basis. So this is a gentleman, 42 years old, came to me with acute onset severe right C7 radiculopathy with pain, sensory symptoms, as well as substantial triceps weakness. These are his x-rays, which are essentially normal. But on the MRI, you can see that he had a right-sided foraminal disc herniation at the C6-7 level, which corresponded to his, to his symptoms. So I indicated him for an endoscopic posterior cervical foraminotomy, especially given his um, triceps weakness, you know, prolonged non-surgical treatment was not felt to be appropriate. So let's go through the steps together. So the first step is preoperative planning. And one piece of information I like to go in to the operating room with is how much of that facet I can take, how much of the, the SAP and IAP I can take um, before I start getting close to that 50% mark. And what I end up doing is I plan this on the preoperative CT or MRI, um, and you want to get to the lateral aspect of the pedicle. And so what I'll do is I'll measure from the lateral aspect of the pedicle to the medial aspect of the SAP. And so I know going into the case, in this case, I was able to take 6.2 millimeters of bone. Um, so I know how much I should expect to take um, in the case, and that, that can help keep me oriented. OR setup, once you get into the OR, I don't use any sort of cranial traction. So this is very easy to set up. I put the patient on a, a head holder that has some adjustment, and I try to get him a little bit of flexion, but, but it's not that I need to put him in a Mayfield or anything like that. The next thing you're going to do is localize and dock, and it, it turns out that this surgery doesn't work nearly as well if you do it at the wrong level, and <laughs> it's easier than said than done at times, um, you know, especially in the lower cervical spine, people with big shoulders, short necks, it can be hard to see on the lateral. So you sh in those cases, you should really be prepared to do almost all of your localization on the AP x-ray. And that involves, you know, counting down from C2, counting up from the ribs, etc. So when I get to the OR, I get a, a perfect 
AP x-ray of the neck uh, with no rotation, and I like it to be lined up with the disc space of interest. I mark the midline, and then I mark the medial aspect of the pedicles on that on the ipsilateral side, and then I mark that um, disc space. And, and where those two lines intersected, that's where I make my incision. And then I do flip to a lateral x-ray before I make my incision just to make sure everything lines up. And what I want to see is that the trajectory of my incision is in line with the disc space. So I make my incision, I cut through fascia, I dilate down. You want to land on the, on the medial aspect of the facet joint, on the lateral mass. And if anything, you want to cheat a little bit more lateral because you're not going to hurt anything lateral, but you absolutely don't want to be in the canal, right? So I cheat a little bit lateral, I take an x-ray, I dilate down, and I put my scope in. The next thing you're going to want to do is find the V, the interlaminar V. Some people call it the interlaminar Y. That's your initial anatomic landmark. Um, and take some time to get oriented. So this is what it looks like once you clean it off a little bit. So to get you oriented, um, we are on the right side at C67. Cranials to the right of the screen, caudals to the left, medial is the top, and lateral is the bottom. And what you can see is this interlaminar V. So on the right side is the C6 lamina. Um, on the left is the C7 lamina making that V, and in between is the interlaminar window. And so once you've identified that, and here's just a, a schematic showing that, once you have identified that, you're much less, less reliant on fluoroscopy. In fact, after I've done that, I don't take any more shots for the rest of the case until my final x-rays just to prove the extent of my decompression. So you're, what you're going to do is you're going to resect the medial aspect of the IAP and then identify the SAP below. Um, initially, I'm conservative with bone removal. I mean, you can, you can always take more bone, but you can't, you can't put it back. So what I'm doing is I'm removing just enough of the IAP, um, you know, the, the lateral aspect of the lamina and the IAP, to, till I find that SAP below. And where that SAP starts, that's the start of the foramen, by definition. It's underneath the joint, right? And so here's just me drilling that C6 IAP. Um, as it gets thinner, um, what you'll see, and you know, I remove it, and underneath it is that SAP. If you're drilling bone, IAP or, or caudal lamina, and it's still soft underneath, that's okay. Um, you're still over the canal, and you just got to keep working lateral until you find that SAP. And you know, it's better to err on the side of starting drilling more medial, um, because if anything, you just waste a little bit of time, but you haven't taken away too much bone. And then, you know, I know from my preoperative measurements, in this case, that I wanted to take about six millimeters of SAP, and you know the size of your drill. So, so that's how I get an initial orientation as far as how much bone I'm going to take away. Then you resect the medial SAP. Um, I drill first. Um, but remember, the nerve is directly underneath that bone. So, so I really thin it out, really thin. It's almost clear. It looks like ice sometimes. And then I'll use the smallest kerosene to remove just that last layer of bone over the drill. Excuse me, over the nerve. And it's important not to leave any of the cranial tip of that SAP behind because that can be a source of residual foraminal stenosis and potential symptoms. So this is what I was talking about. This is me removing that last wafer of bone with a kerosene punch. And underneath it, you can see the neural elements there. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to find your pedicles. And, and this is really the key anatomic landmark once you get down to help you define the extent of your decompression. What you want to do is unroof the foramen from the bottom of the pedicle above to the top of the pedicle below. Pedicle to pedicle decompression. And then to the lateral borders, just past the lateral borders of the pedicles. And I'll show this later, but you can actually see this with the endoscope. Unlike how I used to do this with a tubular retractor where you, you kind of hand wave and you pass some sort of ball probe out there and say, oh, I think we're lateral to the pedicles. Eh, it's, it's, you know, a little bit unclear, but with the endoscope, you can actually see this stuff. So this is, this is me palpating the pedicles. So this is the right C6 pedicle that I have my cautery on, kind of the the medial um, aspect of that pedicle there. It's important in the cervical spine, unlike the lumbar spine, where in the lumbar spine you dock your working cannula down in the canal, there is not space for that in the cervical spine. 
So you have to keep your working cannula docked on the lamina or the facet joint more superficially, and then you work down into the canal with your instruments. And then this is me palpating that C7 pedicle, the, the top of the C7 pedicle. And so I know I'm, I'm pedicle to pedicle decompressed. Then if there's a disc herniation like there was in this case, you can start to investigate the disc space. And there's no... Um, dogmatic way of doing this. It's not like in these cases I go above the nerve, in these cases I go below the nerve. Honestly, I just see what it gives me and, and which site is easier to get to. And oftentimes I'm going back and forth above and below the nerve to make sure that I've gotten that disc material out. So this is what you can see here, removing some of that disc material from the nerve. I find that the lateral recess, lateral to the cord, because you can never retract the cord, but just, um, just medial to where the for aim and starts, there's usually a little bit more space there. And you can get your instruments in and then slide them laterally to get to disc material that's in, in, in the frame in itself. And then you confirm that your decompression is complete. And there's a variety of ways that I do this. The first is visualization and palpation. So, you know, what you see here on the left in that photograph is um, retracting the nerve from below. Um, on the right side, I'm retracting it from above. So the nerve's free and mobile and there's nothing underneath it that's compressive. And in the middle, you just see a video showing kind of clearly there's dorsal decompression there. And then this is my favorite part of the case. You, you can rotate the scope around 180 degrees and look back toward yourself in this kind of out of body type experience and really see, you know, that's the pedicle of C7. And then you're going to see the pedicle of C6 on the right side there. And you can actually see the pedicle sloping away and be very confident that you've done a good decompression. I get x-rays with a probe, you know, at the, at the pedicle and the pedicle. Um, showing that I've been everywhere I want to be, and then out the foramen. And then I also save the disc material, if this is a discectomy, um, and kind of make a pile of it on the back table so that I can correlate that with what I would expect based on the MRI. Then you get hemostasis. I don't use any sort of drain, but I do get very good hemostasis before I leave the OR. You can inject like a dilute thrombin solution, which is helpful for this. This patient, you can see uh, where I did my little foramenotomy on his post-op x-rays. So you can see I circled it there. Um, and it's exactly what I was aiming for. He did very nicely, you know, home very quickly, complete resolution of his symptoms. This particular case was done over a year ago, and he continues to do very nicely. Every once in a while, you have to re-image your patients. Um, fortunately, the vast majority of these have done extremely nicely, but every once in a while, they get imaged for another reason, and it's cool because you get to check your work. So here are two separate cases that I've done, and what you can see is I accomplished the decompression that I set out to do. So really removing the medial aspect of that facet joint, but not greater than 50% of it to expand the dorsal confines of the foramen. Here are the steps that we went through. I won't kind of walk through all of them, but you'll be able to refer back to these videos. And, and if you take these on a step-by-step -step basis, it's a very reproducible type surgery that's extremely rewarding. Now, there is a learning curve associated with this. I would not do a cervical case as your first ever endoscopic case. Um, but once you get comfortable in the lumbar spine, this is very manageable surgery. Christoph Hofstetter and I published each of our learning curves and similar to the lumbar learning curve literature, what we, find, what we found is that even from the very beginning, we were safe and effective. So our effectiveness and complication rates really were the same and have been the same from the beginning, which you know, should give you some confidence that you know, once you get pretty good in the lumbar spine, you can do this in the cervical spine. But what has improved with time is our operative efficiency. And then lastly, durotomy management. Um, as has been mentioned in the previous session, you know, most durotomies tend to be very small, even though they look really big on your screen. Um, and because there's a lack of dead space here, they don't tend to be symptomatic. So this is a durotomy I got on, on a separate case, a very tight um, spondylotic level. Um, and it was in kind of the nerve root sleeve in the shoulder where it connected the dura. So not something amenable to direct repair, regardless of how you're doing this. I just take a, a piece of collagen matrix and, and place it over that area to help contain it, um, close, and then treat the patients as I would anyone else. No particular restrictions. And fortunately, the vast majority of the cases, they have not been symptomatic at all. And I've not had to have returned to the OR or anything like that for these patients. Like, comment, and subscribe for more spine-related content.